So, Charlotte, thank you for uh, accepting this invitation. Uh, today we continue with a series of talks which is called Landscape Exchange. It's a virtual platform to share the information knowledge of uh, landscape in the context of architecture, urban police, infrastructure and research. And um, today our guest is Charlotte Malker Bartz. I'm not sure if I say it correctly. Architect, scholar and urban designer focusing on the impacts of political, economical and social agency have on urban territories. Uh, today she will talk about the urban politics, politics of landscape and infrastructure, focusing to Toshka project, a massive agribusiness infrastructure in the desert of Upper Egypt. Uh, I would like to say something about Charlotte, that she uh, graduated from um, Faculty of Architecture in Marseille, also uh, Faculty of uh, Technology in Vienna. She holds Master of Advan Advanced Study in Urban Design at ETH, also PhD from ETH on food territories and the effects of the political economy of food on the built environment with a focus on Egypt. She's currently guest professor at TEU Berlin investigating the mechanisms of real estate development of the German capital. Uh, she's also principal of the urban design practice called Omnibus. Uh, she directs, since 2014, she directs the Master of Advanced Study in Urban Design at the chair of Mark Angeli. Uh, she was creating 12th Architecture Biennale of Sao Paulo in 2019. She is also co-author of many publications and books like Housing Cairo, The Informal Response. Um, she's founding member of Parity Group, its association uh, with Dubravka Sekulic to improving gender equality in architecture. And some her latest publications are Some Haunted Spaces in Singapore, Eileen Gree, A House Under the Sun, uh, and she has been involved in many uh, lectures, articles and writings. I think you can add something if you want, Charlotte. Maybe I need something important. Uh, no, it's pretty complete. Thank you. Uh, I'm not, uh, I finished my guest professorship at uh, TU Berlin. Now I'm a postdoc at the chair of Tupalovich at uh, ETH. Mm -hmm. And I will start uh, an assistant professorship uh, at Harvard GSD in the fall. So that's the latest update. Right. Actually, we have Milce Topalovic uh, before you, but she recommends us you instead yes. of her. So she's a how, great mentor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I mean, at your requests, uh, somehow because of your, uh, let's say, the curated topic of your of your lecture series, you are um, interested in this question of uh, water infrastructure and landscape. Uh, and I think that's the uh, so the talk that I will give now uh, on on the Toshka project, uh, biopolitics on the Nile, is somehow fitting to that um, to that uh, particular interest of yours. Um, I think that uh, maybe I can just give a little bit of context on uh, why I have um, done this research. So um, the Toshka project is actually the third case study of um, my dissertation on the political economy of food system and how food impacts um, the environment or our environment. And um, the last one is, is the Toshka project. So it's part of my dissertation. Um, so here you have in a dark suit wearing aviator style glasses, uh, President Hosni Mubarak, who is uh, standing with his uh, arm on the railing overlooking um, the blue waters of the Mubarak pumping station, which uh, has his name and is uh, in the background here. And this is a press photograph that dates from 2003 during one of the many visits that uh, the president of Egypt, back then the president of Egypt, took um, to the Toshka project. Uh, and there's actually a whole image collection that documents uh, President Mubarak inspecting 
the construction site at Toshka at various stages. This image is actually a very famous. He waves at the um, engineer so that they kind of initiate the project. And this project, the Toshka project, uh, includes the Mubarak pumping station that we just saw. Uh, it takes water from Lake Nasser, which is the reservoir of the Aswan Dam, uh, into a 310 kilometer long water channel into the desert, which uh, aims to irrigate some 1 million hectares of fields for cr crops and fruits. And that's part of the new Nile Valley vision, which I will um, discuss afterwards. So these images somehow they span from the late 1990s to the mid 2000s, and they attest of uh, the political relevance of this hydro infrastructure for uh, Egyptian governing powers and the desire of the regime to somehow uh, exhibit confidence in a scheme that claims to solve water supply, food security and overpopulation issues through its gigantic enterprise. And here you have another image of President Mubarak looking at fruits and vegetables and the Mubarak pumping station in the background. So um, these images, they also confirm that Toshka is a presidential project and it positions uh, its champion in a long story of, uh, of Egyptian rulers who have embarked in these large-scale schemes. And there is in Egypt a, a legacy of monumental infrastructure and modern water projects that have been presented as uh, national technological achievements, uh, such as the High Aswan Dam. And this project, they also um, served as governmental instruments of political power and social control, also because they foster national pride and they divert attention from other issues. So uh, to give you a little bit of context, the Arab Republic of Egypt is a 90 million inhabitants country south of the Mediterranean Sea, where agricultural land is a scarce resource. And you can see on this uh, plan, the gray hatches is actually corresponding to the some 3 million hectares available for food production uh, in the country. The rest is actually desert lands. And if you would compare, actually Germany cultivates something like 18 million hectares with a similar amount of population to give you uh, a, best, a bit of a sense. So most of these fields are uh, located along the Nile Valley and the Nile. And maybe this intense geography uh, explains a little bit the importance of water management and infrastructures. So my talk is organized in three parts, which are aiming to give uh, a kind of a, 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 explain the legacy and the origins and also the motives of this infrastructure uh, and why I argue that this is a biopolitical infrastructure. So Egypt has actually a very long history of hydraulic management, artificial irrigation and flood control. Um, and the Nile has been a managed river since pharaonic times uh, with uh, annual floods, which uh, basically um, came with a predictable regularity. So let us um, look a little bit into the infrastructural chronicle of the river. So in fact, for Egypt, the Nile waters uh, were imperative to ensure the local food production. And there's a very fine balance between the appropriate amount of irrigation and actually floods, which was somehow a matter of life and death. And the security of this uh, water flowing down the Nile is directly related to uh, the population's food security, something that is very clearly materialized by the uh, building that you have on this slide that is called the Nilometer, which is a water uh, measuring infrastructure dating 800 uh, after Christ. And if you see it a little bit, you have here uh, a kind of uh, scale and what the water would arrive here. And if it reaches no higher than here, it says hunger and then suffering, uh, happiness, security, abundance and disaster. So there is only a fine threshold when there is enough water, but not so much as to drown everyone. So um, it's also a story of uh, uh, that is very well documented in La Description de l'Egypte, which is the um, material that documents the occupation uh, that was chronicling the story of Egypt uh, when Napoleon occupied Egypt from 1798 to 1801. And you have here several um, uh, images and gravures that are depicting uh, how water was actually channeled into reservoirs or irrigation waterways along fields, uh, pumped by animal, human and hydraulic forces. 
And this basin irrigation that you can see here in this diagram is actually allowing cultivation of only one crop a year. The water would come in and then out again when it floods. And then when uh, Mohammed Ali Pasha, which is the father of modern Egypt, took power in 1803 uh, and made the country independent from the Ottoman Empire, he shifted this agriculture uh, from this basin irrigation to a perennial irrigation system with a network of canals in the delta. So it means you would have not only one harvest, but maybe two or three harvests a year because you can control this irrigation. Uh, and the Mahmoudia Canal, which is linking the Nile to Alexandria, which is actually here, um, is the first water infrastructure in modern Egypt. Uh, but in fact, there came rapidly a very big issue is that this, uh, the maintenance of these canals, uh, which was based lar largely based on forced labor, so some kind of slavery, peasant slavery, um, didn't work so well. And uh, to increase agricultural production, um, there was a shift to a modern perennial irrigation system, which was based on the construction of reservoirs and barrages on the Nile, so as to raise the water level, such as the building that you have here, which is the Delta Barrages, uh, which was built quite fast from uh, 1860 to 62. And the uh, Viceroy uh, wanted to go so fast that he suggested to use the uh, stones of the pyramids to go faster. Uh, this was not done. Fortunately, there was uh, enough people who were against it, so he decided not to do it. Um, and this barrage is not a storage. It's only basically blocking the water as to raise the water uh, when it's closed, and then it lets the water into uh, the canals go upstream and then downstream when it's um, kind of up. So uh, it was actually completed five years before the Suez Canal, to give you an idea of uh, where it stands in the story of infrastructures. And uh, they very quickly showed that they were not uh, sufficient to retain water, uh, even if they allowed some 300,000 hectares of the Nile uh, to switch from uh, basin to modern uh, perennial irrigation. And that, of course, dramatically increased agricultural output. So there's always this correlation between uh, the management of the water and the food and the agricultural um, output. So this infrastructural chronicle of the river uh, which can be considered as initiated by uh, Mohamed Ali with this Mahmoudia Canal and the Delta barrages that you see here uh, on, the, on the top, uh, on the Delta. After that, uh, Ismail, which was his grandson, focused rather on canal construction with the Ibrahima Canal that is um, here, 1873. So in fact, the political history of the Egyptian nation state is somehow linked um, to that of the river with its ruler, which were relying on the construction of this modern infrastructure to regulate the water levels, to secure food production, uh, resulting in territorial transformation as a physical expression of biopolitics. And here I want to explain a little bit what I understood by biopolitics. Uh, biopolitics is a term that is um, described by Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault places the history of food supply at the center of his account of biopolitics. He defined biopowers as techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of the population, such as public powers and the welfare state, um, institution and new bodies of knowledge designed to deal with physical aspects of human life, such as fertility, health, disease, longevity, or morbidity. And I argue that food and the control exerted over its production, access, or supply is a material expression of biopower. So food policies and food security are belonging to this ensemble of tactics, procedures, and apparatuses of security that target populations. And Foucault develops that biopolitics originated when politics ceased to be seen as an extension of war, but as a tool to control, regulate, and manage populations at the service of the state and concerned with the administration of life itself. So, and that's why I said that in this sense, food, uh, and by extension, all policies that relate to it uh, is a regulatory instrument to politically control and manage life. And in Egypt, this control is over water, land, topography, and population in order to achieve agricultural and food production. And the infrastructural chronicle of the river that I uh, mentioned earlier is somehow materializing these uh, biopowers. Um, so the British has then pushed the ruler of Egypt uh, which was Muhammad Ali's grandson, the Khedive Ismail, and they were very interested in capitalizing on the country's main economic resource, which was cotton, 
which they were exporting to uh, Britain and to the mills of Manchester, for instance. So their primary motivation for erecting a dam was to actually retain water the whole year. And the goal was, of course, to serve foreign interest and generate uh, income for, for repayments of debts because Egypt was very um, strongly indebted at the time. So they basically started a campaign of more hydraulic infrastructure along the river. So the low Aswan Dam was built at the first uh, Nile cataract, so this time not in the delta, but 1,000 kilometers south of Cairo in the valley. They were the, it was financed by the Egyptian national budget under British supervision and built by British contractors with Egyptian labor force. So you have a typical example of a colonial economy, which was, uh, uh, I think, very efficient in that case. Uh, another barrage was built uh, almost in parallel to the Low Aswan Dam, supervi supervised and designed by the same British engineer, William Wilcock. This is the Asyut barrage that you see here, complementary to the Low Aswan Dam, also located some 560 kilometer uh, downstream from Aswan. So after the Delta barrages and the Ibrahimia Kamal, and then you have the Low Aswan Dam and the Asyut barrages, which somehow all materialized this idea of controlling uh, and containing the Nile. Uh, despite this new infrastructure, there were droughts and there were floods, which showed the shortcomings of these uh, controlling devices on the Nile and somehow paving the way for more ambitious and larger projects uh, involving this time more foreign powers, such as the Isna Barrage, which was um, added also afterwards, and the Nagahamdi Barrage. So you have this kind of uh, constant construction of uh, infrastructure. And here I want to mention um, Timothy Mitchell, who says that, um, so the construction of the first dam somehow corresponds to the rise of this engineering expertise and technical uh, developments as synonym of progress that were brought to colonized countries, a legacy that was to infiltrate and grow in post-colonial times. And so Mitchell highlights that water management infrastructure are um, of extreme importance to colonial forces. And he says, dams were unique in the scope and the manner in which they altered the distribution of resources across space and time among entire communities and ecosystems. They offered more than just the promise of agricultural development or technical progress. For many post-colonial governments, this ability to rearrange the natural and social environment became a means to demonstrate the strength of the modern state as a techno-economic power. So dam constructions uh, as a grand environmental uh, engineering project, somehow you can say that they are framed in this orientalist, developmentalist uh, discourse that considers colonized nations as backward and underutilizing their resources and are legitimizing the name of progress, which is the discourse that was adapted and adopted later on by post-colonial powers towards nation building, I think it's even uh, still uh, prevalent today. But let us move to larger scales, actually, with the premises of the Aswan project, as it was first called, that can be traced as early as 1904. Uh, and actually, the Egyptian government discussed it every 10 years in 1919, in 1929, in 1939. But as the Second World War broke, the Aswan project, as it was called at the time was believed to be unfeasible. Uh, in 46, the Ministry of Public Works, so we are still under the British, published a comprehensive water plan for the entire Nile Basin, which was called the Century Storage Scheme. And the author of this report was a civil servant to the British Crown, hydrologist Harold Hurst, who recommended that the Nile waters management should spend over centuries rather than rely on sh short-term planning and should be considered as an entity. And he says, the Nile is a geographical unit and the projects for its full development must also form a unity, the parts of which work together. And so this uh, scheme comprised several projects uh, among which a storage facility at the Uganda Sudan border uh, and somehow his scheme was stretching over the whole Niles without considering borders and it was partially implemented um, in red, you see on the, on the slides in 54, the Owen Falls Dam at the exit of the Nile from Lake Victoria. And then on Lake Albert and Lake Tana, there were also 
uh, dams that were completed. As you know, for a very long time, the sources of the Nile were actually not um, identified. So this vision is somehow based on years of data collection on Nile waters, considering the river is this kind of transnational entity, an entity was, which was actually entirely controlled by the British Crown, as you see on the map here. And according to the estimates, if this sensory storage scheme was, uh, had been fully realized, the high Aswan Dam would not have been necessary. Yet, in fact, Hearst uh, mentioned at the end of his book on the Nile, I have just received, so 1951, a pamphlet by Mr. Adrian Deninos proposing a new dam at Aswan of such a height as to form a reservoir capable of performing century storage on the main Nile and at the same time providing an enormous amount of power by means of which Egypt might become an industrial country. The proposal is worthy of some examination to see whether the difficulties are as formidable as they first appear. So in fact, after uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the free officer took power in 52, they got uh, rid of the British and, and seized um, uh, power. The first tangible plans for a gigantic dam at Aswan, uh, located upstream from the first dam, were considered. And it's 26 times the capacity of the dam that was built before. And in addition to regulating the Nile, it would increase arable land by one third and also boost um, industrialization through hydrological uh, power. Egypt launches the long-planned Aswan High Dam Project, a billion-dollar power, irrigation, and flood control scheme that will increase the nation's arable land by one-third. President Nasser and his guest, King Mohammed of Morocco, lay the foundation stone. And then the first phase of construction under Soviet financing begins. Nasser breaks ground with a 12-ton dynamite blast as King Mohammed and another guest of honor, Russia's electric projects minister Novikov, look on. Nasser sets off an enormous rock slide, formal groundbreaking, the beginning of a vast project that will affect all Egypt's future. The project for Nasser, I mean, I, I, I have other images of the Aswan Dam that I can show you afterwards. But the idea was that the Aswan project was a better alternative to this century storage scheme because it was located on Egyptian ground and it was uh, somehow guaranteeing the domestic control over the Nile water. And it had benefits in political terms because it was showing Egypt's capacity to modernize, feeding its national pride and also legitimizing the new regime by showing its ability to propel the nation into a developing stage. And the dam held promises of self-sufficiency in regard of food production by providing this famous year-round irrigation on the delta and the possibilities of desert reclamation for agriculture and the promise of food security. And this is relevant because food security in Egypt um, is crucial to Egypt, to the government, uh, because the country runs a program of bread subsidies that were institutionalized by Nasser in the 1950s. It's a sort of social contract where the state would be authoritarian, so not democratic, but would provide jobs, services, minimum living standards, and bread. And over time, this subsidized bread became a strong symbol of this social contract between the Egyptian government and the population, and a way for the state to also promote social equity, political stability, and some see it as an instrument of wealth redistribution. But since Nasser, governments have actually kept the political authoritarian side while reducing the economic end of the deal uh, with repetitive attempt to cut the subsidies. So today, uh, these subsidies are still in place. They the Egypt runs a program uh, of um, cheap baladi bread, it's called. It's a flat bread that you see on the lower images. Um, it's available to all, almost all urban uh, consumers. People have now smart cards, but we're talking about 70 million inhabitants that can access this bread, which costs uh, less than a cent of a euro. And here, somehow, you can see this link with Foucault's biopolitics and the control of population uh, with such policies. Uh, these policies come with a cost. Food subsidies are a major drain to the national budget, as Egypt is highly dependent on imported grain, as you can see on this map uh, that shows the flow of imported wheat. We're talking about a uh, 5 billion um, uh, deal between uh, 
you know, Egypt importing grain from Russia, Ukraine, Romania, France, and Poland. This, uh, this ranking varies. You also have US and uh, Argentinian grain depending on the year. Like for instance, I think today or yesterday, Romania decided to block the borders and stop exporting grain. So you can see our, this kind of um, um, dependency is of course very problematic. The prices goes up, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, today Egypt remains one of the world top importers of wheat to sustain its food security and these bread subsidies. Uh, as it does not produce locally enough food uh, and of grain for its consumption. And, and again, here you can see this equation, how do these uh, biopolitics materialize in the built environment and with which consequences? So. Construction under Soviet financing begins. Nasir breaks ground with a 12 ton dynamite blast. As King Mohammed and another guest of honor, Russia's electric projects minister Novikov look on. Nasser sets off an enormous rock slide, formal groundbreaking, the beginning of a vast project that will affect all Egypt's future. It will be built 430 miles upstream from Cairo at a place called Aswan. Thirty thousand workmen will come here to labor eight years, harnessing the fabled Nile, altering the future of Egypt and her people. Materializing the built environment and with which consequences? So maybe this one works. It doesn't work. That's really bad. Charlotte, it's okay. We can put it afterwards to, 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 the, to the final video. Mm -hmm. Then you have to edit me saying it doesn't work. So here you can see, <laughs> so here you can see um, that there are actually huge consequences to the, uh, to the, um, the new Aswan Dam, you have uh, the population displacement and archaeological ruins being submerged, but somehow the motivation and the discourse of, pro of progress um, um, and this kind of motivation to feed the Egyptian population by improving irrigation and agriculture um, was uh, going over. Of course, you are all familiar with the uh, Abu Simbel uh, statues that were relocated in order not to be submerged. So this is also part of this um, this story. Um, so finally, the plans were uh, concluded and the Hydro Project Institute of Moscow actually helped uh, draft the entire project and the dam was completed in 1971. I don't go too much into details regarding um, the kind of, let's say, geopolitics of the project um, because Egypt was a non-aligned nation and it was um, trying to play a game where it would um, um, either be on the size of one block or a side on the other, but here you have uh, a kind of very strong uh, help from the former USSR in the uh, technical know-how and uh, knowledge transfer for the construction of the dam. The dam is uh, 3,600 meter long and it's pyramidal in shape. Uh, it's some 880 meter wide at the base and 40 at the top, so it's a very strong geometry. It's 111 meter above the Nile floor. And the en entire construction itself is actually five kilometers long, including the uh, um, hydroelectric plants. Uh, and then it retains the waters of the flood of Lake Nasser. So when the floods come every year, they're stopped. And basically Lake Nasser is a storage uh, that hold all this excess water for, from floods for several years and it released it in dry time. So it's a regulator in a way, if you wish. Uh, the lake itself is 182 meter deep. The storage capacity is 164 billion cubic meters and it spans some 500 kilometers across the Egyptian Sudanese border. It's actually uh, a really an enormous uh, body of water that has been created. The water surface is something like 5,500 square kilometer and it obliterates an entire region, the region of Nubia. Uh, and there is a whole uh, also architecture stories uh, um, regarding the construction of new villages that um, uh, you probably heard about uh, Hassan Fatih, the Egyptian architect. So there is this new Gurna village and all these stories partially related to the relocation of villages um, following this uh, submergent 
uh, activity. So in a way, I can say that it's not really a surprise that the Lake Nassau Reservoir is the origin of the Toshka project, as we will see, because of the kind of, uh, um, let's say, uh, the, the sheer enormous scale of the project itself. So you can see that we come from the Mahmoudia Canal. I'm not going through again, but this uh, kind of story um, uh, kind of piles up this legacy of, of infrastructure. And uh, we are here in 71, the dam uh, stands and the lake is filling up. And part of this historical nation building uh, discourse of Egyptian Grand Plan, uh, Toshka can, is basically embedded in this list of projects and hydraulic infrastructure, partially inspired by colonial technocracy and associated with agricultural prosperity. So in 78, to release uh, the pressure on the dam in case of high floods, there was an overflow canal that was created and dig. It was called at the time Sadat uh, Canal because Sadat was in power. And it's very, um, it's very classic. The lake is called Nasser. Um, the spillway is called Sadat. And the uh, pumping station is called Mubarak. So you can see there is a kind of uh, very strong legacy of presidential uh, projects. So this overflow canal was actually late, uh, later renamed the Toshka Spillway and it was excavated on the western shore uh, of Lake Nasser into what was called the Toshka Depression. So Toshka is actually the name of this, uh, of this area. And what happened um, is that in 1996 the Nile actually overflowed into the canal, into the Toshka Depression, uh, creating new lakes. And um, Egyptian engineers saw in this spillway somehow the potential to run, uh, to turn the Toshka depression into lakes and reclaim desert land. Um, so here you would actually see again something that you don't see, so I stay on this slide. Um, and Toshka was actually launched in 1997 uh, after this overflowing. So the idea was never to actually use the water of the lakes, but simply to um, create a new, new channel, which would be something uh, much more steady. Uh, and actually the lake are in fact almost totally evaporated today. They don't exist anymore. And in a way, you, you can say that Toshka revived something that is called the New Valley Project. Um, in 58, Nasser had announced desert reclamation for agricultural projects, aiming at food security and population relocation out of what they call the Old Nile Valley. And he said, today, brethren, we turn to the Western desert to establish there a new valley parallel to the valley of the Nile. We are endeavoring to utilize the water of the wells in order to create new lands. There are cultivable lands there, which are being left uncultivated. So the idea was actually to, um, to, uh, to use the water of the Nubian aquifer, which is under uh, the desert that so you can see here on this, uh, on this card. So this idea, was uh, making a Nile parallel to the Nile. And that project is called the New Valley Western Oasis Project. And it was readjusted when Toshka, uh, the Toshka uh, project was created as running from Toshka through the Western Desert Oasis, which are uh, um, existing almost to the Mediterranean using water from Lake Nasser and groundwater from the Nubian aquifer knowing that the water from the Nubian aquifer is actually fossil water. So it's um, non-renewable and uh, it's also uh, kind of dangerous to uh, tap on it because it gets uh, salinated. So you can actually contaminate it. Uh, anyway, so the Toshka project, which was uh, the official name is actually National Project for Developing Upper Egypt, is in fact composed of a new waterway that you see here. Um, and uh, so it's eight kilometers north of this spillway that is there, the former Sadat Canal. So that is actually not being used for any agricultural purpose. It's just a spillway and it's the inspiration of the project. Uh, there is also the Sheikh Zayed Canal, which is named after Sheikh Zayed Al Nahyan, which is the president of uh, the United Arab Emirates, which is uh, financially backing the project uh, for a very clear um, self a sufficiency of food for its own uh, country. Um, together with Saudi Arabia, there is a, a, a joint venture. I will maybe mention it later. 
So the Sheikh Zayed Canal that you see here is supplied with the Lake Nasser water that is pumped by the Mubarak pumping station to irrigate uh, the sands of the Western Desert. So all of this was completed in 2005. There are of course some urbanization projects that go with it, which uh, you can see here are quite uh, uh, not very attractive in terms of urban life. This is the new Toshka city, um, which, are, are, uh, which is intended for 50,000 people, but of course this is uh, barely uh, completed yet. This image is from 2016 and it has not changed. I actually checked it yesterday. Um, so the ultimate idea and the goal of Toshka is to go out from the Nile Valley and to set up these new agro-industrial population centers in the Western desert. And Toshka should irrigate something like 200,000 hectares and be home to some 20% of Egyptians. And it was presented as a population, as a um, solution for Egypt's urban density, food insecurity and unemployment in one massive project. As many other political projects in Egypt, the plan appears as some kind of substitute to public policies, offering social, economic, and political solutions, all achieved through spatial means. And here you can see um, the project in 2001 and uh, this irrigated field. You see that the Lake Toshkas are completely uh, almost dried out. And then you see this irrigated field. Uh, the owners of this field are not the Egyptian government. They are actually in the hands of, um, this is a Saudi government or Saudi companies and Emirati companies, which are using it um, to uh, uh, basically uh, grow crops and then um, take it to their own countries. And here again, I go back to uh, the rule of experts uh, that uh, was articulated by Timothy Mitchell and how global forces, so technology, science, uh, imperial power and capitalism are involved. Here you have technical drawings for the pumping station and you can see in this frame over there, uh, the many foreign companies that were involved in the making of the infrastructure, Hitachi, the Japanese company, Kwerner, um, Lehmeyer, and, and um, there's also SBB, I will mention it afterwards. So somehow you have an insight on how these politics of national development and economic growth are also in fact politics of techno science and also um, this kind of developmentalist uh, uh, mentality. So in a way you have this expertise of modern engineering and technologies that claim to improve the defects of nature, to feed population, to modernize agriculture, to repair society and to fix the economy all in one. So the project is, of course, not going so well. Uh, you have very high saline levels, which means that fresh water is much less than expected. Uh, employment opportunities are very low. You have very, very um, sophisticated uh, tools in there to, to manage this uh, central pivot irrigation that you see on this image, which are basically GP GPS um, um, uh, maneuvered, so it doesn't require so much unskilled labor, which is uh, the majority of the population in the area. Uh, housing and infrastructure actually have yet to materialize, as I mentioned, uh, with these urban centers that are um, barely existing. And ultimately, the food production at Toshka is basically concentrated on profitable export crops for foreign companies, rather than on food for domestic consumption breaking this initial promise of local agricultural production for food security. As I mentioned, um, when uh, the, the, what is produced there is actually mostly fruits for exports or food for um, directly uh, nourishing other countries and not Egypt. Uh, only one of these 22 monster pumps that were installed by the Swiss company IBB um, at the Mubarak pumping station are actually operating because um, it was an over-dimensioned project. And still, even though Toshka um, is actually considered to be uh, dysfunctional or largely dysfunctioning, uh, as there is some 21,000 hectares cultivated, the current government with the Abdel Fattah el Sisi has actually revived the project. Um, and then there are some estimates that the infrastructure is said to be 90% completed, whether it's operating, um, that is another question. It said 70 years after its launch, the Toshka project in southern Egypt desert has been revived amid a number of reclamation projects by the Sisi administration. And this is also showing somehow um, that there is a, a full circle done from Mubarak um, 
caused a revolution in Egypt to uh, the current regime. So somehow, um, the Toshka scheme appears as a political and territorial act implemented in the name of food security involving foreign expertise, local actors, and international capitals. It materializes as a spatially grounded instrument affecting the built environment through large infrastructure, shaping territory and its organization, what I have um, called a biopolitical infrastructure. And here you see um, some um, plantations near the uh, Sheikh Zayed Canal in uh, 2011. So to conclude, um, you have seen that this somehow successive powers have attempted um, with larger and larger schemes to control the Nile towards the declared goals of food security, uh, agricultural innovation and industrialization and of course vested political ambition. So from the initiator of Egypt's modernity, Mohammed Ali, we have the Mahmoudiya Canal, the Delta Barrages, his grandson, the Khedive Ismail, and the British colonial powers with um, this kind of series of smaller barrages to uh, Gamal Nasser with the New Valley and the High Aswan Dam, and of course the Lake Nasser to Hosni Mubarak with the Mubarak pumping station, the Sheikh Zayed Canal and the New Valley um, revival, including current president um, El Sisi reactivating these old, sch old schemes. All rulers of Egypt have contributed to creating a body of controlling devices and regulatory instruments concerned with the administration of population through the management of water, land and food production. And they are materialized by this large hydro infrastructure these biopolitical instruments reveal the relationship between food system and the built environment, the influence of global forces on local realms and the political significance of food security as a dynamic force in the transformation of space. So uh, maybe I can show you now these um, videos that refused to work earlier. Because they are quite um, telling, especially the one on the uh, Aswan Dam. Mm. Mm. Refuse to play. Okay, then I don't show you. So thank voilà. you for the talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I, I think I'm in time. I was 35 to 40 minutes. Yes. That's the time. I still have five minutes. <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> I think I'm good. And it's the three minutes of the videos. <laughs> <laughs> So do, do you think, it, is there any chance that this Toshka project is going to work in a, in a near future or it's completely... Uh, going to uh, work, you mean? Yeah, yeah because you, you described it's not working as they, as they planned or as it was engineered. Yeah, I mean, I think it will, let's say that it is working to a certain extent. The question is for who is it working, no? Because it's working for... I mean, I didn't go too much into detail, but you have this whole, um, somehow it's almost like a neo-colonial story where you have um, an entire, let's say the land actually, so maybe there is an interesting uh, thing that I didn't mention, but in Egypt, everything that is not agrarian land, so <clears throat> the desert belongs to the state. And the entity that is in charge of taking care of this land is actually the military because everything that has to do with deserts is related to border control and, and uh, this kind of, uh, um, let's say, uh, security related issues. So the military is de facto the owner of this land. And when they sell it, they make a huge profit because they have a lot of holdings that are related to land reclamation, uh, you know, irrigation projects and everything. So you have a kind of loophole to, um, let's say, 
siphon the, um, the kind of uh, governmental funding into semi-private entities. So in the end, um, it's to the interest of the army and of private investor to do this kind of project, even though they actually don't succeed because they get a lot of um, subsidies also through that. So, I mean, there are a lot, the, the, the financial mechanisms are a little bit complicated and not evident. And then you have this story of these um, foreign actors. So the Saudi and the Emirates, they have uh, joint ventures with two big um, agricultural companies, which uh, are bought land in Toshka and, have, and are farming it. And they have certain rules. They're not supposed to grow certain things, but actually they do what they want pretty much. And uh, the idea is that they basically source it for um, guaranteeing food security because actually Emirates, Emirates both Emirates and um, Saudi have a huge issue of water and they, they started to use their water to do uh, wheat production, but then they realized very um, quickly that this was a very bad idea. So actually it was forbidden. It's now forbidden to grow wheat in, in Saudi Arabia, for instance. So they do that in Egypt. And then for the Egyptians, the whole argument, and this is something that has been um, advised by the World Bank and the, um, even the, 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 how you say, the, the food and agricultural organization, the argument for Egypt was you plant and produce um, fruits that you can export or flowers actually even that you can export and sell. And with the money you can buy the wheat that you're also buying outside. So it's completely ag against the kind of the whole political argument. Uh, let's say the political argument of food security for Egyptians or for the nation is the argument that is used to construct these things. But then the reality is that these um, are just, um, let's say, being used to, to uh, the, it fits in a neoliberal discussion, let's say, or like argument. So it works, but uh, it doesn't work for Egypt, let's say. I mean, it works. I've not been there, but from what I have researched, it's not, uh, it's not working so well, but yes. How did you start with researching or being interested in Egypt? Or also you did some writing about the informal Cairo and housing in Cairo, Toshka project. Yeah, I started to work on Egypt because I was, uh, I started working on it when the revolution happened in 2011, actually. So it's already almost a, a decade. Um, the main, the, so the spark was actually this um, demonstration where people were holding bread in the demonstration and i at the time i was doing research on food for our chair and then i started to collect these images and then i have this entire collection of uh at the arab spring um demonstration where everyone at one point has bread the people are like the bread and they're holding and it's different breads because it's uh you know in tunisia it's uh the french bread the baguette and then in other countries it's the kind of flat bread and there is this bread and I was like what is this what's with the bread because I was interested in the more uh, you know more evident I was more interested in like the the urban protest and how how urban space and protest so political protest so that was the origin of the project and then because of this bread thing I started to investigate in this um, relation with with bread and then and then I started to look at Egypt and very quickly actually um, I found out that Egypt has this story with the subsidies and also the kind of urbanization, informal urbanization, which is a destroying uh, the kind of landscape that is behind me, which is this um, um, Nile Valley and Nile Delta, very beautiful flat landscapes. Um, and, and somehow um, <clears throat> everything is related in a way. So the fact that the people have this bread in this demonstration, especially in Egypt, and actually all of these countries that have the bread is mostly because they all have bread subsidies. So there's the whole story of bread being a political tool that symbolizes the discontent of the people. It's the symbol of this deal somehow, the political deal between the people and the government. And the fact that the bread is in the demonstration talks about the fact that people expect I mean, it's a kind of a, a heritage of the welfare state, but it's a political tool, obviously. 
And actually, I just want to, <clears throat> as a footnote uh, about food subsidies, uh, many countries have food subsidies. It's just that in Egypt, it's very frontal, no? It's very obvious. You have um, bakeries and people go to the bakery and they buy the bread and, that's, and the bread is almost free. So you have a kind of very clear one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, biopolitic in a way. But in other countries like the US, you have food stamps. Um, I don't know, France, Switzerland, you have the subsidized canteens for students or there is some food that is cheaper than others. So there, are, I mean, this form of food subsidy is actually something you find in a lot of countries and it's just not frontally addressed. So let's say that the Middle East has this kind of more, you know, blatant or evident relation to show the food subsidies actually happening. So people have this bread as a symbol. So that's the start. And then very quickly finding out that there is this problem of urbanization destroying the local food system. There's also the neo, all the neoliberal discourse, which is um, very much about disengagement uh, in the rural areas. So that you don't support uh, agriculture, you support new technologies, new agriculture, you support spending on technology, uh, but you don't support small farmers, which basically will sell the land and then it will be built over. So everything is related in a way. It's everything is very, there's a, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a system. And it's, and it's a worldwide system, of course. I was just mentioning uh, the fact that Romania closed the border to its export. Uh, I mean, the 2011 Arab Spring, for instance, um, there was a Russian drop and the Russians stopped the exports of wheat, which means the wheat went more expensive. Automatically, the rest of the food also goes more expensive. Uh, so the price of wheat stays the same in Egypt for the Egyptians who buy this kind of subsidized wheat. They don't change the price. The price is the same since 1989. What changes is the weight of the bread. The bread goes smaller. The price stays the same. Because if you change the price, you have a riot. So the mechanisms <laughs> are very simple. And, uh, and uh, so these kind of uh, these issues, they, are, they have very, very large global ramifications. It's never just... Um, locally uh let's say um it's not it's never just something that's happening at the local level there are always kind of ramifications and maybe something like uh, uh because katarina freleihova is also like published logistic mm -hmm. landscapes Mm -hmm. uh, also, Martina Svobodova is interested in informal, like informal uh, yeah, actually, housing, or I'm not sure, so you can tell something more about it. Uh, I just wanted to like uh, have some discussion about the informal and also the role of architect today with publishing and with this kind of, uh, that architecture is some kind of agency of. Mm -hmm. I saw somebody got the, the got housing Cairo delivered at his office, who was it? Yeah, that's our Dharma <laughs> Space Gallery. <laughs> it's nice. I thought it was sold out, so I'm happy to see that they still, uh, you can still get your hands on it. We are planning to release it in Egypt, actually, now, which is interesting. Let's see. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't know who, who was working on informal and... Uh, actually, me and Katarina also, because uh, Katarina has a project yeah. about... Uh, logistic and together we uh, working on like informal uh, informal architecture in Taiwan especially ah, okay yeah but uh, yeah if you if you can describe a little bit about like I read some of your uh, articles about like um, how is the field uh, replaced by informal housing mm -hmm. and if you can ju just like basically explain us how it uh, how is it happening there and uh, mm -hmm. like some more should I, should I do another lecture? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but like... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, actually what you see behind me is, uh, is very typical of what is, uh, what, is in, what is most of the Egyptian fertile land looks like that. And actually you have very uh, typical uh, form of uh, agricultural production, which is a uh, fedan, so it's a kind of longitudinal um, field. It's just related to irrigation and inheritance and it's very thin stripes basically. And um, of course the, so Egypt 
I mentioned earlier is uh, I think it's almost 100 million inhabitants now. And uh, what happens, I was talking about this relationship between, uh, you know, everything, how everything ties together. If you don't uh, invest in the rural world, the rural world goes to the city because, you know, why would people stay? You know, this, ex this uh, rural exodus that has happened in Europe uh, happened everywhere. So people go move from the countryside to the city because, um, they are looking for employment, uh, better opportunities, jobs. I mean, the countryside is hard and it's poor, so uh, it's very understandable. So people move to Cairo because Cairo is basically the heart of everything. People say Egypt is Cairo and Cairo is Egypt. It's very, um, it's like really the center. It's 25 million inhabitants and it's almost impossible to access the formal housing market. Uh, for anyone who moves. So if you are, let's say, lower middle class, everything that is on the formal market is way too expensive for you. Uh, there is very, very little uh, public housing. It's practically inexistent. So your only solution is the informal um, construction. And um, this basically has... Uh, materialize at the immediate fringes of the formal city or of the traditional city. So you have an entire belt of informal settlement that have grown at the immediate limits of the city because it's super, it's super well connected. So it's the whole interest is that you will be living next to where the employment and the businesses are and, and so on and so forth. And what was there was the agricultural land. So first it started with a North of Cairo, you have these kind of old villages. So they started to grow, but then very quickly you have settlements that appeared in the mid, late 70s around um, uh, all the areas over agrarian land. And uh, because the land is private, people have started to purchase it and they built over it. And that became uh, the kind of uh, modus operandi of, uh, of uh, informal urbanization in, 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 in Cairo. Uh, we're talking about 12 million inhabitants, so this is not a minority that lives there, not at all. And you have people from, I mean, university professors to, you know, like street cleaners that live in these areas. Um, and they are, uh, I mean, they're informal because they don't, uh, they're mm -hmm. not legal, right? It's actually forbidden to build over agrarian land, so that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the first thing, that's the informality. So it's not that they don't own the land because most of them actually do, but they own a paper that says that you have one twenty-fourth of that particular piece of land. And in, in order to get, uh, to get official paper, I mean, this is practically impossible. It's not that there's not enough law. I think that there is actually too much law. There is so much laws that it's practically impossible and very expensive to actually legally build on these pieces of land. So no one actually does it. And then it's a system, no? So people start to build on this kind of field. So the field, if you want to build, you will probably feel the, the canal, the, the water channels that are connecting the, uh, the field, which means that the field itself in the middle or wherever it is, it doesn't have this water connection. So it's becoming, it becomes impossible to, to farm it basically. So de facto, whenever there is something built somewhere, it condemns the whole field, right? Because of this kind of stripe system. Uh, and then it's, it's um, you have the shade and the trash. I mean, it's, it, it starts to be unprofitable. So the farmers, they don't farm food. They farm only uh, stuff for animals and that's actually generated much less money. Um, so in the end, it's kind of a, it's like a downward spiral. It's almost impossible to not sell if you have land there, unless you have a, f maybe there are a few pockets that are remaining. It's mostly because the farmers have a will, so they have direct access. They don't need the, the kennels, uh, or because it's someone that don't want to sell and just left it there and make sure that the tenant is still on the land. Uh, so there are very few reasons why uh, why uh, it, it doesn't uh, get built. So it's it's just it goes on and on. The government has no interest doesn't doesn't even recognize it. So it's illegal. It doesn't exist. It's like it's something. But people vote, for instance, huh? and they all have uh, electricity meters and stuff like that. So it's a kind of very um, 
I mean, it's very typical to informal. Some of some things are legal, some things are not. Uh, it's more expensive to live in an informal area than to live in a formal area because you pay electricity, you have to bribe the electrical company, you have to pay for your water to be delivered in your tank because there's no water. You have to pay for the guy to come and pick up your 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 sewage water. Um, there's no public transport, so you have to pay to pay a tuk tuk to go there. So in the end, it's a uh, it's not as as uh, it's it's basically it's uh, it's unjust urbanism, you could say. Uh, but the, the construction themselves are very stable, actually. They are concrete and brick, so it's actually quite. Uh, but there are some like uh, companies, uh, like construction companies. And how about uh, how does it work? Like uh, you can, for example, you hire someone like engineers. Uh, I mean, for example, in Taiwan, we also like uh, there are also like normal unregistered uh, companies, and people can they have like general knowledge how to build because they st they have like. Uh, about the construction, like they do the testing and everything. So it's quite well done, actually. And I read that in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, it's like 14 uh, floors also. So, mm -hmm. so there must be also the... like a system on, of the company. So how, how does that, like the government just uh, pretend it's not happening or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the government has, uh, has uh, you yeah. As, um, let's say is doing other things, but uh, um, I mean, it used to be something that was very much out of need. I don't know what I don't know about the Taiwan case, but uh, in the beginning, it was really um, people just needed a place to stay, and then some people also did it out of investment. Uh, there was a time where men went to work in the Gulf, so they they had remittances they could pay. Uh, and so they they build a, a house. So usually they would ask someone else to check how to do it, and they would have some. There were there are plans that circulate, and this is also why, as architects, we try to to influence the plan. We propose other plans that were a little bit better, and so on and so forth, with the idea that this plan can actually, you know, as the other plans, they can just circulate. Um, so these plans circulate, and then you, in the beginning you would do you will build only one floor, for instance. You have one floor and then you would leave it one floor for as long as you didn't have the money to build a second floor or if you need to build a second floor because your son is getting married because very often it's family-based uh, mm -hmm. construction, you will build a second floor and a third floor and so on and so forth. So it's very incremental. Uh, it's also related to the fact that people don't have money so they have this kind of uh, rotating uh, money system. I don't know if you're if this is a, also existing in other countries, but in, in Africa it's very common. It's a, in, in Egypt it's called gamaya. It's a, it's like if all of us we put we we put ten euros together and then uh, one of us gets married and uses that money, and then next year uh, we we collect the money, so everyone pays five euros or. Uh, every every month or something like that and the money kind of uh, gets uh, accumulated and then one person can use it for a particular purpose and you do that on, on and on as long as everyone actually benefits from that so it's kind of a self uh, manage uh, um, saving system no? uh, so people would do that but then what happened is that um, at one point basically there is a kind of a uh, speculative uh, uh, phenomenon that happened, which means you start to have like semi-professional companies or like semi-formal companies who started to, to, to operate and they would buy a land and they would build and they would build to sell. So they would, and this you can still see uh, they, these 15 stories. Uh, most of the very high ones are actually built all at once. They're not incremental. They're built, it's an investment, somebody, buys the plot, puts the money in and, and builds up. So you have also kind of a semi, uh, it's, it's, it's capital. So, so kind of capitalist uh, system, which is then uh, built, to, built to sell. Then it's also stupid to a certain extent because usually you can only sell the first sixth floor because people don't trust the elevators. So they don't buy up. They don't buy. 
then it gets, mm -hmm. it stays empty. And you can see you, in a lot of pictures, you see the upper floors are not occupied because the units are delivered without any furnishing. People buy it and then they would, they put the, the, the doors they like and the windows they like and everything. So actually, if you don't have windows, it's not sold. That's as simple as that. So it's informal in many ways, but in many other ways, it's very close to formal. Actually, a lot of these companies operate in formal construction sites also. So it's kind of a gray, uh, it's, it's a gray economy and there is no government that doesn't actually control these things. What is being controlled is uh, under Mubarak, it was more difficult. And after the revolution and with the current president, it's not, it's not being controlled. Mm -hmm. Under Mubarak, people would build at night, for instance. Or they would build not at the end of the road, but in the middle of the field so that you don't actually really see it. Of course, you see it, but not really, really. Mm -hmm. So they were like this thing. And then if the officials would come, you would have to pay. I mean, so it's... But now, now it's much more uh, laissez-faire. There's no... The, st the, state is, the state is weak, weaker than under Mubarak, actually, even though it's more uh, repressive. But I'm, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this. <laughs> but all these areas are, seems to be very interesting. I don't know, these informal things are also happening in Balkan, where I'm from. Very much for, me, for me, it's kind of more interesting than the real estate architecture, some new architecture. I don't know. It seems to me that it's in kind which of way more interesting. Somehow in, it's more human, or I don't know. It's kind of somehow current. No, of course, because but because but, but when it's built out of need, then it's it's. Uh, but in in this case, in the case of Egypt, it's really becoming something that is that has turned into a, a speculative uh, format. So it's not. I mean, it, it's, but it, maybe speculation is also human, you know? Mm -hmm. But how, how is, for example, uh, like when you, when you look at the map, uh, for like top view on the Cairo, it's quite like, before I, I uh, know about uh, your lecture and before I look at uh, your stuff, what you're researching, uh, sometimes I just went to Cairo on the map and I was like quite <laughs> excited about like, informality in Cairo and I was just asking by myself like how I can divide what is formal and what is informal because I guess not, I mean what is okay there are no there are a few things that where you can divide the aesthetics are very close it's true mm -hmm. so but uh, the location is uh, because most everything that is built on agrarian land is informal by default because it's forbidden to build on agrarian land. So that's kind of the basic thing. But then you also have informal uh, areas that are built on desert lands, usually it's squatted. Uh, some of it is built on old old military things, and that's it's just extremely organic. It's the stuff that is built. So the the interesting thing is like the stuff that is built on agrarian land is actually very structured because it follows this system of you have the the former agricultural practice so it's mirroring the property lines and this kind of subdivision mm -hmm. so it's always this kind of very square thing so it's very structured and the stuff that is built on desert land is much more chaotic it's very organic um, so that that is a kind of a let's say a subdivision within the informal uh, and then the formal things they usually get plastered that's the difference because you need somehow yeah, if you have a legal um, permit you have to plaster it but now recently i think two years ago the president uh, made a decree and said that the it has to be painted that the informal areas have to be painted otherwise you get fined so you have an illegal building that you have to paint otherwise you get fined for something that doesn't is not even legal so the whole thing is like and it's extremely ugly because this aesthetic of raw brick somehow is has a beauty you know it's very hegemonist it's very and painted it looks terrible of course <laughs> i mean but this is a footnote really it's not about the aesthetics but mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so yeah there are ways to differentiate clearly and then everything that is built uh, i mean the the formal uh, the formal 
sector builds uh, villas or or uh, mass housing in the periphery where it's not uh, where you don't even have a bus to go to so people don't have cars like it's a very it's very unjust uh, the but is there the is there some like differences between dimensions of the streets and uh, like if if they if they still like follow follow the the width of the streets or no but there is no there is no uh there is no formal construction on uh, on agrarian land everything that is on agrarian land is informal uh, if you want to build according to the law, it's modernist planning. So it's a huge plot. Uh, it's streets with double, uh, twice 20 meters uh, uh, wide um, streets. Uh, it's uh, it's a completely other thing. If you look at this Google Earth thing, you can see the <clears throat> the difference is uh, it's it's very clear. It's not, it cannot be, it cannot be, uh, it, in fact, it cannot be uh, mixed because everything that is formal, if it's really legal and follows the rules of the, of the, of the government, it's, um, so mm -hmm. this is informal, oh, everything that is following this kind of, linear structure is informal okay mm -hmm. because of these lines that i mentioned this uh, this uh, field they are called fedans and there is a practice in in agricultural um, management of the land there that uh, you divide it into kirat which are actually smaller plots of 12 by 14 and those actually correspond to the kind of single buildings no so all of this is completely illegal, all of it. Mm -hmm. Everything that is like on this, everything that is, uh, basically you can see, this is the formal city. So this Mohan mm -hmm. was built in the, in the 60s, 70s. Everything after the train tracks, all of this is informal, all of it. Mm -hmm. All of it, all this here. And then the formal reappears here. This is the Pyramid Avenue. So things that are like this, this this is like this is legal because it's on the street side and it's kind of but then as soon as you go into back there into this kind so this is also legal legal there is like structure legal and then very clearly when you appear on this kind of linear stuff this is illegal for instance i mean of course it's not so evident but that's quite a, a general and then if you look at what is being currently produced uh, in the formal sector, you go to the desert city. So this is 6th of October. Um, and then you have this kind of urbanism. Huh? This is what, this is the formal city. <laughs> this is what it being is, but that's what I mean by um, modernist zoning plans. No, this is like big streets. And then, and then you have this kind of, uh, here do we, uh, we investigated, this is Alegria. This is a, a huge suburban model. And they have to build, they, everybody has to have view on the golf. So that's why it's like that. No? <laughs> Nobody is golfing there, you know? <laughs> um, and this is, this is watered with the, with the Nile water, of course, huh? all of this, because there is no water here. Everything is watered with the Nile. Uh, anyway, so this is still unbuilt. That's interesting. So this is a uh, 6th of October. It's part of the new cities. And you see all around Cairo, you have these new cities. This new, this is a uh, 6th of October is one of the first. And then you have like a uh, new Cairo. This is the one of uh, Mubarak. Mubarak wanted a new city. So new Cairo is here. And then uh, this is Medina T. It's also this kind of like crazy. You see, everybody has this system of view on the Gulf, no? And, uh, and this is of course the new capital here. So that's built on sand. Yeah. Nothing. I, this I visited in 2019. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's nuts, really, it's crazy. And it's a new, new, new city. So you see this idea, actually it's, it's very, very linked to what I was discussing, this thing about this idea of going onto the desert to, to escape because Cairo has a bad idea, bad image and people say it's congested and nah, 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 it's horrible. So you have this also land reclamation. This is all new. Huh? Also pumped water from the Nile, all of it. 
new cities, new agriculture, and then you kind of argue that this is old and crappy and so it's a it's a general it's a mindset. So, actually here so there are also some informal like settlements in the desert, as you mentioned. Yes, there is. Which the are different. Esbet <laughs> Kerala, for instance, here you don't see so well, but there you will see. In a better, with a better resolution, for instance. Right. It's a nice video. <laughs> uh, yeah. So with Hezbet Kerala, this, for instance, is built on, this is illegal on desert land, for instance. And you see it's like kind of very organic. I don't know if we can see the development. I don't know, these images are not so. Yeah, it's, it's already built. So, and, and then it's, it's being destroyed to, to do this kind of roads, you see? Just mm -hmm. um, and this is formal development. So the difference is very clear. So, but of course you have the organic city, but then you also have like this kind of. Uh, what about? Is there something like a tension between like formal neighborhoods and uh, informal neighborhoods when they are close to each other, like the area would be? Well, um, I mean, one serves the other, no? That's the thing. For instance, here, everybody, all, everybody, ha they all have maids, no? They all have uh, staff and all the staff lives here. It's like the, it's like in, in Sao Paulo or in, in this kind of... It's like, uh, it's like everywhere, so that's why I was kidding. It, this is always the same, no? It's like, yeah. this is an, it's an ecology, no? It's like uh, mm -hmm. pe people, so there, there is no, I think that there is no, it's also not possible to tell who lives where, no? Because people who live in this area, these are not slums, no? These are mm -hmm. like, the area that we investigated for the book, so whoever has the book uh, can share it with the other, but the area that mm -hmm. we investigated is here. This is uh, uh, Ardileva. And actually you see here, there is a kind of, you don't really, see, I don't know if you see it so well, but yes, so there is an exit here, no? For the highway. Mm -hmm. This exit didn't exist. They made it during the revolution. They rented a caterpillar and they just did it themselves. <laughs> and then what happened is that the price of land here went up like crazy, of course. <laughs> but it's not, this is the official exit, no? That's how it looks like when it's done by engineers and that's how it looks like when it's just done by people, no? Just like that, bam, <laughs> should go up. So... There is a tension, but not really. I, I have not. Uh, it's just that people say it's horrible, but actually, they, there is no. I mean, I haven't really witnessed, like, or experienced um, any kind of like tension between these, mm -hmm. two, especially not in these areas, because those are very close together, actually. But these informal areas are the spaces where there is no architect. It's like, uh, what do you think, so what is our role are... then? <laughs> like to learn from these spaces or like research them or I don't know. It's kind of uh, looking like they're also functioning in some way. Yeah, of course they're functioning. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's always important to ask ourselves uh, the relevance of our profession in this context. Um, so we actually operated uh, in this area because we, uh, I did uh, several design studios there where we basically proposed alternative designs and uh, so whoever has the book will find some of them yeah, in there at the end, uh, which were mostly related to how you could, for instance, build things together so you could optimize things or optimizing certain uh, uh, dimensions and so on and so forth. It's true that there is no engineer, but there is um, very often, there is a structural engineer. I mean, they ask someone to have a look at the plans. Usually what happens is that the structure is overdimensioned because you have, I, I mean, that's also the modus operandi is interesting. And I think that architects don't do that. And also if investors would do that, you will have a very different looking landscape, but if you do, uh, if you invest 
and build something and want to sell it, you have to move in it for a while and prove that it's well, <laughs> that it's sound and stable and not going to fall. And then you can sell it. People don't trust you if you don't move in the building. <laughs> so maybe architects should try that. Um, <laughs> But I think it's very relevant your question. But it's a it's a question that uh, that the are that the profession is uh, is anyway uh, struggling with uh, a lot, no? Especially yeah. in these times, no? Mm. Because mm -hmm. at the moment we can do we can propose uh, la laser the three D printed uh, glasses <laughs> or, or cardboard uh, desks. <laughs> uh, that's what we have managed to produce so far. Okay, that's mean but um, <clears throat> the question I think I mean in my case I can say that one of the most important aspect was basically related to the production of knowledge and the fact that um, by you know chronicling documenting and analyzing um, the work there was also an agenda of uh, of proving that these areas are actually valid and that they should be considered completely as part of the city and be also um, equipped with infrastructure and, you know, be considered as complete part of the city. So that's a very locally grounded argument, but somehow the fact that um, you can, uh, you know, uh, prove that there is a value to this kind of uh, architecture is something that made sense to this project at least. And then, um, I mean, I still have an ongoing project there that we would like to build. Uh, it's, it's, it's taking a lot of time. So we hope that we can build because we wanted to build a pilot project that shows that um, design can also be something uh, important or relevant in these areas. And uh, our client was, uh, was, is somebody who built there a lot and he was interested because he, maybe it's a bad sign, but somehow he was also looking for ways to, you know, sell different units because he's a semi he's like a semi-formal developer so in a way it's a very classic uh reaction of architects who just like kind of uh are are uh, you know increased value by by design because you know the market is a bit saturated so how do you make something different uh but yeah so i think those are those are a few of the reasons uh, that uh but also architects don't engage at all. Local architects don't engage with these uh, areas. This is something that I never fully understand because that I think there is no money really, but you could probably find other ways. Very recently, there was a, a somebody built something in Esbet Khairala, actually. I can uh, send it, share it to you on the screen. So I will stop the share, but uh, <clears throat> there is a, there was a, an architect that built something in, um, and in the, one of these areas that are, not um, built on agrarian land, but on, uh, so it was published in Ach Daily. So it's a very, um, I don't know if the, sh sometimes the, somebody, pe people cannot click on the link. So I'm sending it now. Maybe you can see if you can click on it. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Um, on the chat. Yes. Yes. Okay, so here it's a, in, in a, it's a cultural center. So it's one of these examples of how somehow design can be re-implemented. I mean, I think it's, I think they did quite a nice job with knowing the area. I think they did quite a ni nice job with what they had. Mm -hmm. So it's also possible to engage, but you need, you need, uh, I mean, the, the guy who built there, it's either via an NGO it's illegal to build, no? So of course, as an architect, that was one of the problem we had with we, this project that I'm talking about. Uh, the the university got uh, got scared, didn't want to participate because it's, it's Ill an illegal construction. So how do you justify as a university that you're actually building something in an informal settlement? Mm. So everyone uh, kind of, Abandon the project, so we're we're still uh, trying to make it happen. But uh, so yeah, um, you have to hope hope it works. But I think I was happy to see this project because I thought that it was a, a proof that somehow it's also possible to re-engage with the with the area, which is something that most architects, local architects, don't do.
All right. If there are no more questions, or are there some more questions? Maybe I have one last short question. You told us about like two different scales, scales of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's like enormous uh, based on profit. And it's actually the state actually wants to build more and more. And there's all this history of building this in infrastructure. And then there is this like city infrastructure, which is completely missing in these informal areas. Do you see any like need or or more like interest from the city or state or municipality to change this like any mo positive trend um so no of course you're you're right you identify one of the most i would say heartbreaking uh um phenomenon no it's like all this public budget that is being uh, invested into this huge water infrastructure that I mean especially the last one I think the last one them you could probably discuss whether I mean I think it's I mean there are people today that say that it's uh, it's a disaster because it's uh, the fertility of the land is lost no the land is getting less and less fertile but that's another story <coughs> So you have this uh, enormous budget uh, drain, no? And at the same time, you have these 12 million inhabitants that are without proper infrastructure. Uh, and then you had the revolution where people, I mean, the original, the origin of the revolution uh, in one of these streets that I was showing before. In Nahia Street, they were, that's where the people that started the revolution were coming from. So they they walked all the way from there to Tahir. And then you have this kind of um, huge mobilization of these areas, people used of this area to really demand change and you know succeed in, in overthrowing the regime. Um, so there was a huge hope that uh, the new regime would actually you know, tackle that. Uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power, so when Morsi was in power, they stopped all these big projects. They were completely against Grand Projet, completely against. I mean, they were complete, they were a terrible government for many reasons. Um, but that is something that they really didn't want to do. So they really stopped these big projects. They were, they were not uh, willing to invest. They stopped it. Uh, they were focusing on other things and they and they they stopped to do that so there was and then with the first uh, al sisi cabinet there was a ministry of informal settlement which was the fir for the first time it used to be a secretary of state so the ministry of informal settlement started to engage uh do urban upgrading um you know kind of uh, it's a uh, leila iskander which was a, a very um a very good, uh, very good, uh, very good politician, if you can say such a thing. I mean, she was somebody who was really engaged. I mean, actually, we had, we were, we had a partnership with them, with the Ministry of Housing and everything. So there was really a moment where you could tell that change could happen. There were projects initiated and so on and so forth. And then um, the cabinet was uh, reshuffled. The Ministry of uh, Informal Housing became a uh, state secretary of something under the Ministry of Housing, knowing that the Ministry of Housing is the one that generates this uh, kind of, you know, zoning urbanism that I showed before. Um, it was the end, basically, of the opening that was there. And uh, since then, it has been back full circle to how it was before and perhaps worse. So not very hopeful at the moment. But we never had to deal with the state really. I mean, the time we did, we had this deal with Leila Iskander, for instance, and people, people do this stuff, no? They don't wait for the government to, you know, also be under Mubarak, there was no upgrade or very few upgrades. I mean, and, and people, people don't, uh, don't expect the government to come up with these things. So 
the people are resourceful. So you have these kind of old systems of like, they like this example of the highway. Uh, I mean, they, in, they in, even invited the governor to, to open the, 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 the self-manager highway uh, exit. They invited the governor. They were like, we did it, now you come. And then the guy came and they opened it. They had like a ceremony. <laughs> Amazing. And, but this was, uh, in this, this was in the vacuum of power between the fall of Mubarak and the SCAF and then the armed forces who then took power. So there was this, there was a, there, there has, there was a window and I think that window has closed. Unfortunately. So people are on their own. So they do what they can. I mean, people are really extremely resourceful, but it's very unjust. People install their own sewage system. They rent a, back, a caterpillar, they dig the street, they buy the pipe, they put the pipe, they bribe the officers so that they can connect to the city's system. Mm -hmm. And then they roll with it. But this is the ones that are very organized and close to the city. If you're in an informal settlement, that starts to be outdoor, that is not so organized, not so well connected, you're on your own. So it's tough. I mean, the, the state pro provides this kind of uh, public housing that is nowhere, really, like literally. So people don't have work because this, these people are relying on informal work. No? So they walk, people walk, there's no, they cannot afford public transport, they cannot afford informal transport, they walk. Uh, to their jobs, which is a job that you have for one day, no people. I mean, this is it's really survival, no. And so, and then the state says, okay, we will demolish this area, and you can get an apartment in New Cairo or in in sixth of October, the, the in one of these kind of new new things where there is no job, no public transport. If there is a school, what happened is that the mothers take the kids to the school in the morning, they pay the tuk-tuk to go with the kids and they wait in front of the school the whole day because they don't have the money to pay for the tuk-tuk and go home. This is the life of people there. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very, I always tell this story of the school because I, I find this so unfair and so unjust and so, you know, like this is really unjust urbanism, you know, it's like, and then people leave, they, they sell it they rent it and they go back to live in a one room in the middle of these informal areas because they cannot find a job there. They cannot live. So they live. And then people say, ah, you know, people don't, they don't like it. And then they leave. You give them new house and they don't like it. And like, who wants to stay and die there? No, it's like, so it's, it's, it's very bad. I think the situation is very bad. I'm sorry to, <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's also uh, actually these areas are also very nice uh, they're very uh, lively and they're very uh, people are very take care of each other I mean it's a very there's a lot of solidarity it's organized religious communities are very uh, vibrant I mean it's a, it's actually a great neighborhood but it shouldn't be that they're left to pay for everything on themselves you know that's unfair they don't pay taxes so you have a whole uh, strand of economists who see there an untapped resources. There is a, a work by De Soto, which is a famous uh, UN habitat economist who worked a lot on informal question, who did the work on, on informal settlements. And he, uh, he advocates that you need to legalize because then people can pay taxes. So it's, an, uh, it's a kind of, uh, it's a, it would be an incentive for the governments to actually uh, legalize these areas and, um, uh, you know, kind of integrate it in the city. I mean, in the long run, this is the solution. You have to legalize. This is a solution that the Brazilian government, the previous ones, uh, was actually good at. Uh, good at. I mean, the kind of le legalization mm -hmm. of, of favela and working and upgrading and so on and so forth. This is something that there are precedents. I mean, this can be done. So in the long term, let's say if you see, uh, let's say in a... In a Maybe in, in, in these days you don't know. So maybe if uh, the regime changes, then uh, the, the, the hope would be then these areas need to be legalized and upgraded and, and then everything will be fine. 
but I don't see that happening right now. Not with the government in charge at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. All right. So maybe I leave you to that. Um, if you're interested, there is an, actually we published two books. So there is this book, there is the one that you have, which is called Housing Cairo. And there's the second one, which is kind of a, the, it's like informal, formal, even though we never call it like that. It's like uh, Housing Cairo. And then the other one is called Cairo Desert Cities, which is a, mm -hmm. the second volume in a way, even though it's, uh, they can be totally um, apprehended separately, which is more about new cities. Uh, around Cairo, so it, it's this kind of uh, on look into the new cities, which is also part of this rhetoric of leaving Cairo and moving to the desert and finding new new cities elsewhere and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, if you're interested, it's also something maybe to look at. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the invitation. I would have liked to come to Prague and uh, yeah. give this lecture in person and then we would have had dinner and a few drinks yeah, and it would have been very nice. nice. That would be very nice. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> I'm in my, uh, my cabin in the woods in Switzerland and you are somewhere in Prague. But I heard you guys are going out of confinement soon, no? Maybe you can go out. We, we are also able to probably go out soon, but traveling, 